Well, I'm here at Millennium Space Systems with Tim Barrett. Tim, I understand that you have a connection with Griffith Observatory back in the past, but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do here at Millennium, and also, what did you do at Griffith Observatory in the past? I'm an Associate Tech Fellow at Millennium. Uh, I run the avionics and RF group and have been here 10 years. Uh, so I get the joy of uh, building spacecraft. Before that, I performed the Laserium shows at the observatory for nine years. It was uh, the longest running live attraction in Los Angeles up there. It's premiered in 1973, and so its 50th anniversary is coming right up. The most amazing building you can, run, you can be in uh, with a great show like that and the most amazing views of the city of Los Angeles. It's just incredible. It's been a pleasure joining you here today at Millennium Space Systems. Great to have a connection like this here with Boeing. And they did uh, fund our school programs, believe it or not. We have a grant from them. So we, we thank you for that. Thank you so much for visiting us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, now I'm, I'm an astronomer, of course, and I grew up a fan of astronomy, but even I went to Laserium one night with some friends, and we had a good time. It was a lot of fun. Over two million people came up there into the planetarium based on Laserium. Well, that's really, really fantastic. Now, that somehow has brought you here uh, to a career in STEM, essentially. What is it that you do here at Millennium Space Systems, and what happens here? At Millennium Space Systems, we design and build uh, high-performance small satellites. We fly them in groups called constellations to perform national security space missions like missile warning and missile tracking. We take them from build to orbit in as little as 12 months, which is an incredibly short timeline, and it gets the job done. Wow, now that's, that's a surprisingly short period of time. Now, do folks already have in mind what they want these satellites to do when they come to you? Sometimes they do. Uh, we're in the process of building them sort of on an assembly line now, and we're able to pull them off and modify them for exactly what the customer needs, and that's how we get there really quickly for national security needs. Now, um, can you see these satellites up in space? I know that I've seen certain things go over, but what, what are we looking at when, when we see things up there? That's true, you can. Uh, for about an hour after sunset and about an hour before dawn when the sun is on the satellite and the sky hasn't lit up yet, you can see things. For example, you can, with a little bit of planning, you can pick out the International Space Station, mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing. We have another case where uh, Ellen Glad, a young researcher here, is taking telescopes in the back parking lot and looking at our wide field of view satellite, looking at it, and then uh, seeing if she can detect it, which she did, and then I was able to verify that with our 5.4 meter dish in the back parking lot and the RF signature and see it. So that was an incredible experience for both of our teams to show that, that we could do that. Wow, Th that's a lot of fun to do. So now when you say a dish, you're picking up like radio waves from it in addition to seeing it with the telescope? Absolutely, those two things together allowed us to verify that what she saw is what she thought she saw. Okay, <laughs> now at, at All Space Considered this month, we're celebrating Earth Month. Um, and of course with Earth Day and a, a real focus on the changes that are happening here on Earth. Can satellites be of any use to help us understand what's going on? They certainly can. Uh, NASA put up uh, satellites in something called the A-Train. Uh, four satellites with 15 sensors on them at all different wavelengths. They're all in the same orbit and that provides an amazing ability to compare their data and find out things like they're watching for rainfall, cloud cover, carbon emissions, uh, even volcanic activity. Uh, Bill Pritchard at Cornell is actually predicting volcanoes now by looking at minute changes in the Earth, and that's coming from satellites, which is sort of mind-blowing. So now this tracking of greenhouse gases with satellites, this goes beyond your typical weather satellite that used to just be able to watch the storms come in. We're now able to track changes in climate with these this technology. Certainly. Different things of ground penetrating radar in a variety of different ways to look at things like vegetation and where it's changing. They can be watching for the ice caps and ice sheets moving very, you know, very easily, visually obviously, uh, but lots of other things too in terms of depth and, and penetration. So the radars are getting incredibly powerful. So now I know that NASA supports a lot of these missions. Um, how does Millennium Space Systems come into play with that? Do you work with NASA? We do. We have a mission called Tracers with the University of Iowa. Craig Klitzing is the principal investigator for that. Uh, I went to school there, so I'm excited to see this thing go. Tracers' job is to look at the Earth's magnetic field. 
And the goal there is to figure out if it's changing, which is always sort of true, but how much and then why is it changing and what's it doing out there? Yeah, well, well space weather, um, the sun is connected with that as well. Um, our very own Katie Flynn at All Space Considered talks about that each month. So how does that impact satellites? Do, do you have to take any precautions for your satellites to avoid these coronal mass ejections and these flares that happen? We do. Uh, they're, they're built generally to, make, to tolerate much of that, mm -hmm. right? So we do have to take care of that. And we're very interested in, in the amount of in, uh, energy that's going by during those types of things. So they're generally built to handle that. In extreme cases, yes, we could a lot of pull things together and, and hide or turn away from the sun mm -hmm. if, that were, if that were important. And sometimes yeah. it is. So kids that are interested in STEM today might not know exactly how what you do connects them to STEM. Uh, what should they be thinking about to get excited about science and technology? Well, almost everyone has a phone in their hand. That phone is A, incredibly powerful and needed to be designed by somebody. So you've got a whole electrical engineering, mathematical sort of background there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also, you're, almost everyone is tied to uh, GPS satellites right now. I can't go across the country, I can't go across the city, I can't find McDonald's without GPS these days, right? Or my friend's house. Not to mention, where am I? So kids these days, my kids have grown up expecting to be able to find themselves with that. Well, that's because of those satellites. That might give you a reason to want to do that, find a different way to do that, or keep them running or build new ones. It's, it's around us and there's no going back. Now, if a young person wants to get involved in STEM and wants a career in science, what's the best way to get involved with that? Do, do you have any suggestions for them? Sure, uh, my son, got fascinated with uh, a video game called Kerbal Space Program, which is amazing. Uh, it's actually a pretty decent representation of how we fly satellites and move them around. He did that. Uh, as it turns out, we've even hired some people whose initial spark of orbitology came from Kerbal Space Program. So anything like that that piques your interest and gets you going, uh, gets you moving. I am also guilty of playing Kerbal Space Program as well. And I have to say, I had a, a little Kerbal astronaut stranded up in space. He, he couldn't get back down. Certainly, if you, if you like that and it does pique your interest, it's an awesome reason to stay good at, at math and uh, science, uh, robotics, physics, those sorts of things. I wasn't very good at math when I grew up, but uh, I find it fascinating to be able to derive uh, formulas you had to learn in school. And that turned out to be you know, quite engaging and quite fun to do later on. So I'd say don't give up. Don't give up. And, and interest in telescopes, and interest in lasers, like Laserium. Um, being involved with technology in general, I think, is, uh, gives the kids a sort of a head start on a lot of this stuff, I think. So thank you so much for this opportunity today at Millennium Space Systems to be able to talk satellites and Earth. Now you're bringing them technology and science and the future at your current job. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for having us. Really appreciate it.